Hi, I'm Mary. And I'm Katie. And this is the Housewife Did It. True Crime Edition. Surprise for Katie Edition. Mm-hmm. Um, happy Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I, I think this comes out two days two before. Two days Halloween. before. Mm-hmm. Um, we are done with the witches. Sorry. Um, um, but this case is just also scary. Oh, good. Um, because we don't know what happened exactly. And racists are involved so. oh that is spooky yeah it's scary uh, i told my husband today i said i love when we drive by like a heavily decorated for halloween house with a trump sign in the yard and you're like is it is it part of the setup? of the scare display yeah. i said you see it and you go ah. <laughs> um all right so i'm not gonna say this one's like long but it is Definitely longer than some of the ones we've done in the past couple months. They've been a little shorter lately. And this is more of our original length. So I'm just going to jump right in. Cool. No real-time true crime. Unless you have... Okay. At 8.59 p.m. on November 4th, 2018... 27-year-old Jose Barrera placed a call to 911 from his girlfriend's house at 440, no, 4450 Woodlit Court in Cumming, Georgia. His girlfriend's aunt had woken, had awoken to find a woman in a white onesie <clears throat> pajamas um, lying face down and motionless under the back porch about 30 minutes earlier. On the 911 call, Jose told first responders that the woman was not breathing and that there was a small cut on her wrist that he believed may have been self-inflicted. He identified the woman as a friend of his girlfriend's named Tam. And in the background of this call, there is something, some interesting discourse between the women. I could not hear it, personally. Mm. So, we're going to listen to it. I want to see if you can catch what people say they hear in the background. Um, because I could have. So, let me pull it up. Forsyth County, not the one. Hi, uh, yes, um, I, I need an ambulance and a place to my home. What's the address? 4450 Woodlet Court. 4450 Woodlet? Woodlet. Woodlet, okay. All right, 4450 Woodlet Court, what is your name? My name is John Myers, J E A N N E. Okay, and your phone number is 609. Yes. Okay, what's going on? Um, we had people over last night when we were drinking. Most of us went to bed. One of them stayed on the balcony. She was drinking, and we just went out outside. And she's laying face down in the backyard. It looks like me. I'm guessing maybe she fell off the balcony, but she's stiff. Okay. Is she breathing? I, I don't. I don't know if she's face down. Okay. How, how old is she? At 41. Here, hold on. Hey, this is Jose Barrera. Hey, have y'all checked to see if she's breathing? She's not moving one bit. She's not breathing. Um, I just try to assess her Tesla. She's completely face down in the yard. Um, she is stiff. Okay. Do you know if she, um, um, do you see any blood or anything? Where she... Are you there? I am. Okay. I'm sorry. I was outside. It's okay. I'm not sure what happened to Alana there for a second. Do you see any blood or anything to where, uh, from where she fell? Um, I, I don't know if I should move her over. I mean, she's completely close down. Okay. I mean, can you just check and see if she's breathing? If, if she's not breathing and you, and you know she's gone, then just leave her where she's at. If she, okay. One minute. Uh, 
Did you hear anything odd from the women in the background? Could you hear them in the background? <laughs> yeah, I could hear them. I didn't hear anything that was said. Mm -hmm. Um, it just like sounded to me like a casual conversation. Yeah. Like they're just like, oh, I heard that. Yeah. Um, like it sounded like if you like saw your friend on the street. Yeah. Some people are saying that and like I, I, I couldn't hear it, but like I don't know if people have like adjusted the volume and like snipped parts, but people are saying and like it's reported like in sources that you can hear a woman in the background of the call asking if the woman on the ground was pushed off of a balcony. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where we're starting the scene. Police arrived at the scene at 9.07 a.m. and identified the deceased woman as 40-year-old Tamla Horsford. She had been invited to the home of Jean Myers for a football mom's slumber party that doubled as Jean's 45th birthday party. Fun. 45th birthday party with her 27-year-old boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Other attendees of the sleepover noted that Tamla had arrived late at the home the night before where she drank her favorite tequila with the girls, watched football, and played cards against humanity before everyone headed to bed. Tamla had arrived at Jean's home at around 8 or 8.30, despite the party beginning around 6.30. Um, she had been late because she was making dinner for her family. She had five kids um, and a husband at home, so she was making dinner for them, and then headed to Jean's house. When and when she got there, she immediately changed into a white onesie with paw prints on it. She was like, "I'm ready to be cutesy, have a good time." Sleepover. Yeah. According to the women at the party, Tamla got back up at around 2 a.m. to smoke a cigarette on the back porch. It sounds more like she did not go to bed. Mm -hmm. at any point but like i think they had all started going to bed and so i think that that not that she got back up but that she was still up around 2 a.m um going to smoke a cigarette on the back porch and that was the last anyone saw her before her body was found in the morning by madeline lombardi when madeline found tamla's body in the backyard she said she chose not to make her normal morning cup of coffee yeah, I, I, I cannot drink coffee at this I can't, moment. Can't stomach it. Yeah, um, but instead, she got down on her knees to pray. Okay. And then she went to wake Jean and Jose up. Oh. However, when she initially knocked on Jean's bedroom door, she thought she heard the shower running. And so she went back downstairs to check on Tamla again. She was like, no point in me going and talking to them if they're in the shower. Um, and that is when she realized. So I guess she's saying that she thought that Tamla was like asleep in the backyard, passed out in the backyard. Because she said that when she went back out after she realized Jean, Jean was taking a shower, she that's when she realized that not only was Tamla just lying in the backyard, but she was not moving and she didn't seem to be breathing. So she says she then ran back upstairs and went into Jean's room to tell her that their friend from the islands was lying oh. in the backyard and wasn't moving. Weird. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tamla Iana or Iana um, Saint Jour. Mm. What a beautiful name, mm -hmm. was born on October 10th, 1978 on an island country in the Caribbean located between St. Vincent, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In 1989, Tamla and her family moved to the Bronx and then Tamla later moved to Florida. While in Florida, Tamler met Tamler. <laughs> Tamla met Leander. We are in 1989. <laughs> she met Leander Horsford, a single father with a daughter from a previous marriage. Tamla and Leander, who most people call Tam and Lee, got married and had, I put five sons together, but I think it was actually four because mm. she had five kids total. Um, 
quite a few sons together. Her boys were athletes, and Tamla was always involved in their school and sports teams. She was described by her loved ones as charismatic, loving, caring, and fun. And they said that the things she loved most were her family, her life, and you. Because she never met a stranger and always wanted to make others feel included. Cute. Mm -hmm. She was called the life of the party. She was always up to laugh, dance, and have fun with her friends. She was beloved, obviously. Um, The Horsford family moved to Cumming, Georgia in 2012, which is about 40 miles northeast of Atlanta. This was an interesting move for the Horsfords because Cumming, Georgia, which is in Forsyth County, is not historically a safe place for Black people. Um, In 1912, exactly 100 years before their, their family moved there, a white woman was murdered and another white woman was raped, and the residents of Forsyth County blamed both of these crimes on the Black residents of the county. And they forced all 1,098 Black residents out of the county, threatening violence and murder against them if they did not go, and what they claimed was an effort to protect their women. Reportedly, several counties in Georgia around the same time tried to do this, but this was kind of the only one that was really successful. Um, So, like, they're like, what if we just take all the Black people and move them over there, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, As a result the people who did not move out several black men were lynched in the town square and then they left their bodies up for residents to shoot at what yeah and then as we continue so like they no black people in this county no Mm -hmm. stays that way for a while while segregation around the country was coming to an end with the civil rights act of 1964 Forsyth County continued to consider themselves a white-only county until 1987. Wow. When a civil rights march was held in protest of their continued segregation. In response to this march, many white residents threw rocks at the protesters, making it clear that even as the 1990s were fast approaching, Black people were not welcome in coming Georgia. In the year, but after that March, people did start coming in. Um, In the year after Tamla's death, the county's Black population was 3.6%. So, even though Tamla and her family were happy in their new home, she had made friends with other sports moms, her stepdaughter was pregnant with their first grandchild, her boys were doing well in school, but it is safe to say she was the only black person at that party that night. Mm-hmm. And her family was one of the very few black families in the county. Yeah. So let's keep that locked away somewhere. Mm-hmm. When the Forsyth County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene, they noted that Tamla had multiple blunt force injuries, which they attributed to her having fallen from the balcony due to acute ethanol intoxication. They also found injuries. She fell because of that, they're saying? They're saying she was so drunk she fell off the balcony. Oh, okay. Um... They also found injuries and cuts to her head, neck, torso, face, wrist, hand, and lower legs, as well as a laceration to the right ventricle of her heart muscle. Hmm. And that had, because of that laceration, blood had pooled in the lining around her heart. Um, She had also fractured her second cervical vertebrae and her wrist was dislocated. The fracture of her second cervical vertebrae, or her C2, um, did lend itself to the idea of a fall. It's commonly seen in victims of hangings, car accidents, and falls, and Mm -hmm. is caused by, like, a sudden snap of the neck. Um, So they're like, okay, that makes sense. Tamla was noted to have a high blood alcohol level of 0.238 which is close to three times the legal limit. 
and she had traces of THC and an anxiety medicine called alprazolam, which she did not have a prescription for and was not known to take recreationally. She wasn't driving. Let her be three times the legal limit. No tests were run on Tamla's tequila bottle because investigators claimed that if there had been evidence of illicit... Yes. Alprazolam is Xanax. Okay. Just to be clear. So, do you have to have a history of using it recreationally to right. use it recreationally for the first time? Right. Maybe not. Um. So, they didn't run any tests on her tequila bottle to see if there were traces of anything because they said that if there had been evidence of illicit substances, it would not matter because they couldn't hold Tamla accountable for drug possession if she was dead. Which I think is not... I don't think you're point. looking for it to try to prosecute her. Right. I think I think that... You're looking for it to solve this case. Even, like, like one to, like, lend itself to... Did she, like, was, did she take it herself? Mm -hmm. Did someone give it to her? Like, just to have the information, but whatever. Um, police like, believed... well, we can't send her to prison so... for having drugs, so what's the point? Exactly. They said that's, that's their normal protocol, they said. Yeah. Um, police believe that this combination of drugs caused Tamla to topple over the edge of the second floor balcony and land 14 feet below in the backyard. She was found in interesting. The um, her face was down in the grass. Her head was like completely straight down. Her legs were straight out behind her, and her feet were pointed. Okay. So, like, I, I can you picture that? Just completely flat. Yes. Yeah. Um. Her. Left arm was bent up in a waving position, and her right arm was down by her side, like, very close to her body. Okay. So, her whole body This, like, was, sounds like a yoga position. Like, they're, they're, like, straight. Thing. Yeah. Completely straight down, except for her left arm. Um, She was in rigor mortis and lividity had settled in the front of her body, confirming that she had been in that position and deceased for several hours. They believed that her time of death was around 1.45 or 2 a.m. Her cause of death was ruled to be death by falling, which had caused a subdural hemorrhage to the right cerebral hemisphere of her brain, and that the fall was due to intoxication and resulted in a medical event. Okay. I guess that's like what happened to her brain. The manner of death was ruled accidental with odd circumstances. Hmm. I like that that caveat exists. Mm -hmm. People put, nope, not people, police put all of the people who were still there from the party in one room. And then they contacted all of the party goers who had already left and said that they had to return and they put them in a separate room. But together. But why? Okay. They interviewed Jean, Jose, and Madeline, as well as the other party goers who were Paula Seals, Jennifer Morrill, <clears throat> Marcy Harden, Sarah Cockrum, Stacy Smith, Thomas Smith, Michael Pallarino, Nicole Lawson, and Bridget Fuller. Big party. Yeah. Some soft swinging might be happening here. <laughs> um, everyone was interviewed at the police station except for Jean and Madeline, who were interviewed at their home. So, most of the interviews didn't turn up in much information. Um, Sarah Cockrum said that she and Nicole were the first two to leave the party at around 10.30 p.m. Sarah claimed that... She no, I already read that. Sarah claimed that she had a few glasses of wine and just sat and watched football on the couch. It was a pretty normal, mostly forgettable evening. She said that this party was the first time she had met Tamla, but that Tamla had been very bubbly, a very happy person from what she could tell. Nicole Lawson said that this was 
also the first night she had met Tamla and that she didn't feel like there was any drama in the group. She was like, everyone was getting along. It was a totally normal night. She said that Tamla had gone out onto the porch to smoke and that someone had said she was smoking marijuana, which checks out. Um, mm -hmm. And that Jean had asked her to stop calling her the female Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. And then reminding her that her boyfriend, Jose, was a pre-trial officer. So, okay. stop mm -hmm. smoking marijuana on my porch. Um, <clears throat> Nicole had left with Sarah because she had to go home and take care of her dog. Bridget Fuller then told police that she considered herself the mother hen of the group. Because no matter how much she drank, she could keep herself together and take care of the others. Not very well. Yes, queen. Well, she left. She told police a that mother this hen wouldn't leave. If you come together, you stay together. Um, she told police that this was the second time she had met Tamla after Jean's pumpkin carving party the weekend before. According to the investigators who were interviewing Bridget, she seemed very nervous, and they said she overshared a lot. Um, she told police that when everyone else began to go to sleep at around 1.30 a.m., she called her husband to come pick her up. And Tamla, being the sweet lady she is, waited up with Bridget in the kitchen until Bridget's husband could come there. Um, Bridget said that Tamla was eating a bowl of gumbo. Yeah. Just, just at 1.30 in the morning, just vibing with my bowl of gumbo. Like, um, she said she did not seem in any way intoxicated okay she wasn't stumbling she wasn't slurring her words which is then evidenced by like the photos and videos from that night tamla does seem fine in okay. them and everyone says she seemed fine um she did say however that general jennifer morrill was very drunk okay police were like we don't care about that but thank you. Um, when Bridget's husband arrived at 1.47 a.m., Tamla walked her to the door, said goodbye, gave Bridget a hug and a kiss on the cheek. She told Bridget that she was planning to finish eating her gumbo. She was going to smoke one more cigarette, and then she was going to go to bed just like everyone else had. At the end of her interview, Bridget told police that Tamla had walked onto the back balcony at 1.55 a.m. and never closed the door behind her. And police said, how do you know that? You left eight minutes before 1.55 a.m. <laughs> and she said that Jose told her that he had gone onto the back balcony before Tamla's body had been found. And he had seen a lighter and an unlit cigarette. It was later reported that there were two types of cigarettes on the balcony and two lighters. Not just one, like Jose had said. But police didn't test any of them. Cool. Despite Jose admitting that he moved them. Okay. Um, Jose also said that he had found a propane tank pushed over by the edge of the balcony, which he allegedly told Bridget that he thought Tamla could have used as a stepping stool. To, like, climb up and jump over? I, I think... He says a couple of things that, that make it sound like he's saying that he thinks the he cut thinks to her wrist was self-inflicted. Yes. They, they, and we'll see later, this is a, a tall um, edge of the balcony. It's about four feet. It's not something that you could trip over, really. Okay. And, and the police have a really hard time with that. And they'll say a few times, like, she, was she leaning over to throw up? Like, which, and then at some point, somebody asks, was she sitting on the edge? Was she sitting on the, like, fence edge of the balcony? Yeah. And so maybe that's, like, the idea, that she pushed the propane tank up and climbed on and sat on the edge. And in the pictures of the balcony, there is a propane tank up against the edge of it. Um, so I don't know exactly what he meant by that. He's also 27 and stupid, so I don't know. Um, Marcy Hardin told police that she had also met Tamla for the first time that evening. She said that at around 12.30 a.m., she Did and Jennifer... Did they just get out this woman? 
Did they like invite no. her over to introduce her to all these white people just to take her out? This is I, so it's crazy. Like I, like I like it's crazy to me because like it's reported as like she like any report you see about Tamla Horsford, they say like just a woman, a mother at a football mom's party, but it like wasn't. It was John's birthday party and also she didn't know any of these women. She knew yeah. three of them. There were three, there were 12 people at the party, she knew three of them. Yeah. And one of them she had only met one week before. So it's like I if it is this like football moms thing, why is she just now meeting all these football moms? You know, like yeah. her kids been playing football for however long. Yeah. Um cuz this is 2018 and they moved there in 2012. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um So Marcy and Jennifer apparently watched a movie together in the guest room starting at around 1230 and then fell asleep. Uh, Marcy had set an alarm for 4 a.m. to go home and get ready for work. And she left at 410 a.m. without noting anything abnormal. She probably did not go in the backyard. Paula Seals told police that she had actually met Tamla a couple of times through football and that she seemed to be acting normal throughout the party, although she didn't know her particularly well. Paula claimed that she was the first to go to bed, but was still up. So she went to bed, but didn't go to sleep, I guess. So she was still up at around 1.45 a.m. and she texted um, Stacy and but then Stacy didn't text her back, so she fell asleep. Then she woke up again. I think she said, like, she didn't, she went, to, she thought, I don't know what she was saying. She texted Stacy and was like, where, she said, she texted, sorry. Okay. I remember now. She texted Stacy to tell her that she was sleeping in the room next to her. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't require a response. <laughs> truthfully yeah. and when Stacy didn't text her back she thought like oh she must be asleep already because she would care about this riveting piece of information she would text me back obviously um but when Paula woke up in the morning and left at 7 45 a.m she noticed that Stacy and Tamla's cell phones were left out in the living room together. There's like no one sleeping in the living room, but Stacy's cell phone and Tamla's cell phone were there. But that's the only thing that she noticed that was kind of weird. Um, Cause she would have assumed that they would have taken their phones to bed with them. Tom and Stacy Smith told police that they went to bed at around 1 30 AM. It seemed that other than Jean, Stacy knew Tamla best out of the group. When Stacy and her husband were headed to bed, Stacy says that Tamla asked her several times to stay up with her and then and then said, you should share a bed with me instead of Tom. Mm. He's boring. You will be bored of him. Mm-hmm. Um, Stacy said that this is why Paula had seen their phones together in the living room because Stacy told Tamla, well, I, I'm going to share a bed with Tom, but our phones can sleep together. <gasps> That's so cute. (laughs) So she put their phones together in the living room. Um, It's like when you're like, ooh, line our cars up. They can kiss. Yeah. (laughs) But it's like, ooh, look, our phones can sleep together. So Stacy and Tom woke up at around 8 a.m. And Stacy told investigators that she was relieved to see Tamla's car still outside because she had driven home under the influence before and she didn't want her to do it again. She claimed, as did Tom and Bridget, that Tamla had mentioned wanting to leave and head home, which to me contradicts the various statements that she, that they say. They say Tamla was like begging everyone to stay up with her and hang out with her. Like she was like, no, like let's not go to bed. Like I want to stay with the girls. Like have a girls' night. Like Stacy, come sleep with me instead. Like come, some, I'm on the porch with me. I'm gonna smoke one more cigarette. And like don't go to bed yet. But like then they're also saying that she wanted. She was like, I want to go home. Yeah, like, unless she was like, if no one's going to stay up with me, then I want to go home. But, like... Maybe. 
When Tamla's family heard this, they were less concerned by the hypothetical idea of Tamla driving under the influence and more by, like, why did she want to leave so badly? Um, they questioned if something had happened or if someone had done something or said something that upset her. But they say nobody did. Um, Stacy also admitted that the idea of Tamla falling confused her. She said, quote, I don't get it at all. I mean, I've been on that deck like a million times. Like, I've looked and I've tried and I don't understand. End quote. And the officer interviewing her said, quote, I mean, like you said, that she leaned over, was trying to throw up or thought she was going to throw up. Maybe she set up on the rail and was smoking or just who knows, end quote. So there. So this is like where they're trying to be like, how did you fall over a four foot railing? Yeah. You know, Jean's interview with police was strange, to say the least. First of all, she was interviewed with friends over and was speaking on the phone to people at different times in the interview. Jean painted a picture of the night of Tamla's death for police. She explained that Stacy Smith had arranged the party and planned for it to be a girl's night. But then when Stacy and her husband Thomas arrived to get the party started, like start setting up, Jose told Jean that he didn't feel good and he asked if Tom could stay and watch football with him in the basement. Boy. Because, yeah, I said when you're dating someone who could be your mother, you have to tell them, my tummy hurts, can my friend stay? So yeah. I will feel better. Uh, so she was like, <laughs> she's like, that's fine. Like your friend can stay over. Um, so they watched TV in the basement and the girls stayed up at the top. They're also, they, all of the reports say that there was a third man there. I think it was someone's like boyfriend or husband, but he wasn't like, he didn't stay. Like he came in with, he was dropping off his significant other he came in with her and so he was there at some point where he like came in to pick her up and so they made him come back and be like part of the interviews sure. but he wasn't like actually at the party okay. um it was just those two men so she said that the girls ate and drank they watched the lsu alabama game and then the boys realized there was food upstairs mm. Without us? How did y'all not know that? You and just thought so, no one was going to eat all night? Yeah. So then they came up. To, they were like, hey, mom, can we come get food? And she's like, uh, yes. And then they came up and then they stayed up there. They're mm-hmm. like, wait, this is like fun. Um, at around 1 a.m., the women began to get ready for bed. But Jean says that Tamla started trying to convince everyone to stay up late so that she could have more girl time. She said, I never get this. Mm -hmm. I have so many sons. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no. Jean also said that by this time, Tamla had almost completely finished the bottle of tequila she had brought on her own. She was the only person drinking it, apparently, and it was almost gone. But also, somehow, she said that Tamla really wasn't that drunk. Cool. She's incredible. (laughs) <laughs> is she a superwoman? Like, how is she downing a whole handle of tequila? And she's fine, though. Yeah. And everyone else says she seemed fine. Um, she, It's that Xanax. Just balancing it right out. <laughs> I'm chill. Um, Jean told police that when she first saw Tamla's body, she thought it was odd that both of her arms were down by her side and that that seemed like an odd way to land. And police also found this odd because that is not how Tamala was found. Yeah. Not Tamala. Tamala. Yeah. Uh, Girl. Watch your mouth, John. One of her arms was bent upward when police arrived. No one had admitted to moving the body. And Jean encouraged police to check her security system for a better timeline of what had happened to Tamala. Thank God she's got a security system. Are you serious? According to an app on Jean's phone, the back balcony door was opened at 1.49 a.m. and then closed at 1.50 a.m. before being opened again at 1.57 a.m. and then never closed. Despite 
Jose insisting on his 911 call that his girlfriend had cameras set up everywhere, Jean was unable to provide police with any footage from the party or the day surrounding it, saying that she either accidentally deleted it or the battery had died conveniently mm. at that exact time. So she can give them, like, um, it's like two Connie separate debate systems. style, like alerts of what happened, yes. but she just doesn't have like the footage. Yeah, it's like two different systems, like the security camera, and yeah, accidentally deleted it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Madeline was also interviewed in Jean's home. It didn't seem like Madeline was able to give much useful information to police, but some interesting things did happen during her interview. So, Madeline's the Uh-oh. aunt. Okay. Um, so she's one of she only... she lives with them. Okay. She lives and, with And it Jean. was just those three and Tamla were the only ones that were, like, left there when they found no, her? No. So, um, I think Jennifer was still there. Hold on, let me go back and look. Sorry. I'm making mm-hmm. you do more work. Um, I think that Jennifer was still there. <clears throat> I think I know I'd be it. Um, but like some, uh, uh, sorry. I think actually that Stacy and Tom were still there as well. Oh, okay. And then there was someone who had left at like seven forty-five. Okay. Like right before he found her. Um, so in Madeline's interview, Jean interrupted her and investigators several times. At one point, Jean stops to tell the police that she had bought them some Dunkin' Donuts gift cards. And she's like, the oh, let me- Yes. She was like, I bought you guys some Dunkin' Donuts gift cards because you've been, like, so helpful through all of this and, like, so, like, supportive of us. Like, let me go grab them. And they said, that is inappropriate and we will not be accepting those Dunkin' Donuts gift cards, but thank you. Um, And then she interrupted them again to ask police if they were done. She said, because I need to go get ready for this funeral. Okay. It's already happening? Also, we're not interviewing you. Yeah. Go. We're interviewing someone else. Bye. Um, after the autopsy was completed, Tamla's family requested a second autopsy due to what their attorney cited as lack of evidence and injuries and witness accounts that strongly suggested homicide. Tamla's father, Kurt, requested to meet with investigators to discuss his own suspicions about Tamla's death. He felt that the stories of Tamla's friends were full of inconsistencies and that the behaviors they described didn't sound like things Tamla would have done. For example, it was about 35 to 40 degrees that night, Mm. and Tamla had never felt comfortable in cold weather because she is from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. If she was going to go outside to smoke, it seemed odd that she would have done so without shoes. Mm Mm-hmm. Or a jacket. Mm-hmm. She's wearing a onesie. I get the jacket thing. But barefoot? Yeah, weird. Um, Tamla's friends were also confused because, as their words, a seasoned drinker. Oh. She should have been able to handle herself. And even if she had had an enormous amount of alcohol, the others at the party said she was acting fine. So yeah. her like her like actual like close friends they were like she she be drinking like and and she can hold her liquor. So they said it would take an enormous amount of alcohol for her to be drunk enough and to you would have like signs fall off of a rail. Yeah. And like people are saying she no was totally noticed. fine at right. one thirty, and then now we're saying but she's like belligerent enough to fall right. off at 2. Even if like, she finished her bottle of tequila Mm-hmm. She, they say that she. You would died. see that in her behavior. She, yeah, she went out on the balcony at like one forty nine or something. It's only been like twenty minutes. If she, like, that's not enough time to like go from fine to belligerent. Yeah. So, 
There were also reports coming in from Tamla's loved ones saying that she wasn't known to smoke, which is Cigarettes? supposedly or anything. anything. Yeah. Okay. Which is supposedly the whole reason she was on the balcony. But then other reports refer to her as a habitual smoker. Okay. So I don't know which is true. They found THC in her system. So, like, we know she smoked something. Um, and nobody at the party seemed, like, put off by the fact that she was smoking cigarettes. Like, they weren't like, that was so weird that she was smoking. Because, mm-hmm. like, she doesn't do that. Police did admit that they made a mistake. Not in determining He's what born. had happened to Tamla too early on, but in telling her family too early on. Mm. Deputy Mike Christian said, quote, we probably have created part of a mess here. Mm. Just part. We had an idea of what happened, which was absolutely wrong. What I should have done probably was keep my mouth shut and not spun theories. Yeah. End quote. We should just keep secrets from her family. Yeah, maybe. That's the lesson we've learned here. Right. They were like, oh. He was like, I probably made a mess. My, like, a little bit of a pie was part of the problem. But Mm -hmm. my real problem was that I told her family. So, two months later, another autopsy was performed. And although the second autopsy did uncover, uncover further abrasions on Tamla's body. On February 20th, 2019, Major Joe Perkins of the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office announced that the case would be closed because he saw no evidence of foul play. Major Perkins had interviewed 30 people close to the case saying, quote, it was a party. They were drinking. Most of the partygoers had gone to bed at that time and she was on the deck alone, end quote. However, Around the same time, Jose Barrera was fired from his job as a county court officer for internally accessing the incident report for Tamla's death several times. <clears throat> a close Buddy, friend of- it ain't the weed you need to be worried about. A close friend of Tamla's named Michelle Graves had taken to social media to express her concerns and call out the party goers who last saw Tamla alive by name. She's the one who's like, here's who was at that party. Ask them questions. Shortly after this, Michelle filed a police report stating that she believed Jose had been accessing her personal and private information at his job, including a restraining order Jean had filed against Michelle. And when police looked into this, this is when they discovered that he had been looking into the case file of Tamla's death. Buddy. When the public found out about this, hundreds of people took to social media using the hashtag Tamla Horsford to demand the police reopen her case. But before we get to that, I want to continue on this path of, like, something is up in this county. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> In 2014, so this is Mm -hmm. four years before Tamla's death, the Forsyth County Deputy Coroner, Chris Shelton, was forced to resign after photos surfaced of him posing with mammy dolls. That's not good. No. I couldn't find them, but I believe it. Uh, Two years later, Shelton appeared in Facebook photos with Sheriff Ron Freeman Freeman as part of Freeman's 2016 campaign. When when Freeman, even better call, when Freeman was appointed sheriff, he reinstated Shelton as the deputy coroner for the county. Oh, good. Which I think certainly calls into question the character of these two men and how seriously they would have looked into the mysterious death of a black immigrant surrounded mm-hmm. by 12 white people. Mm-hmm. Um, the media has now dubbed the other people at the party the Forsyth 12. That's never good. No. Nah. Um, by the You time don't want of- them to count you. Yeah. It's not good once they give you a number. <laughs> it's either It's either really good or really bad. Like, you're yeah. either, like, you made history or, like, you're in trouble. Or, or you've made history. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the time of Tamla's death, Shelton was no longer serving as the deputy coroner. I do want to point that out. 
However, I do think it's worth noting um, that Shelton and Freeman like had this history and they're pretty closely connected to the Forsyth 12. Yeah. So in addition to being the deputy coroner, Chris Shelton also worked for something called Operation 21, which is a business in coming that aims to educate offenders of the law to help reduce recidivism. Okay. Okay. Operation 21 is owned and operated by a law enforcement and military veteran named Brian DeBlois. DeBlois. Coincidentally, DeBlois' wife, Anna, was the treasurer on the sheriff campaign for Ron Freeman. And the DeBloises are close friends of many of the partygoers who were at Jean Meyer's home the night that Tamla died. Specifically, Stacy and Tom Smith. Mm. Anna, mm-hmm. Anna and Brian seem to think of Stacy and Tom as their chosen family. They spend time with them going boating, celebrating birthdays and milestones. They regularly go out to dinner. They call them their friend family. Mm. Um, so I just think that's interesting. Yeah, I'd say so. So. In the summer of 2020, you'll never guess what happens. Mm-hmm. Tamla's case came back up in the wake of nationwide protests against brutality and racism at the hands of police officers. Mm-hmm. People brought up again that they had doubts that Tamla's death was an accident, and now the public wondered if it was racially motivated. Tamla was the only Black person present at the football mom's party that night. Officials working on the investigation claim that Tamla's death was not racially motivated. Well, okay. Case closed. <laughs> Bye, guys. She fell. <laughs> the end. Um, but others believe that her race setting her apart from the rest of the group had a lot to do with the events leading up to her death. So, like, even if they didn't, like, fell. kill her because she's black, like, nobody wanted to stay up with her. Like, nobody's looking out for her. Like, They're calling her the female Bob Marley. Your friend from the islands is face down in the backyard. Like, come on. On June 5th, 2020, Ralph E. Fernandez, the Horsford family attorney, wrote a letter to Tamla's husband, Leander, in which he said he still believed that the investigation had produced results that strongly suggested homicide. His letter read in part, quote, witness statements are in conflict. A potential subject handled the body as well as the evidence prior to law enforcement arriving. Evidence was disposed of and no inquiry followed. The scene was not preserved, end quote. Fernandez also believed that Tamla's injuries were more consistent with a physical struggle than a 14-foot fall. However, There was no way to prove this because there were no photos taken at the autopsy. Great. In addition to this, the railing of the balcony was a little over three feet tall and Tamla was 5'5". Oh. If she had truly fallen over the edge, it was strange that, one, there was no damage to the railing. Yeah. Like, she would have had to, like, fall through it. And two, Tamla seemed to have, like, easily and seamlessly flipped over the edge and landed completely face down and yeah. straight. I was gonna she say, had... like, if you're thinking, so, like, I'm 5'5", five five, mm-hmm. the, the rail has to be to, like, here, at right. least, right? So then, okay, say something happens and I do a whole little flip. Right. I'm landing on my head. Right. Or I'm doing a whole flip and I'm landing on my Or your leg. body's contorted, snapping, you know? Like, yeah. She just said, um, like, it, you could almost believe if there was, like, no railing yeah. for some strange reason. Right. Someone could step off and just right. fall flat. Right. And they would land beautifully. But, right. yeah, that'd be rough. Yeah. She also had no injuries to her mouth or her nose. And she was found with her face in the ground. Yeah. Um, all of her limbs were straight and intact, minus that one arm that was up. Um, investigators tested this themselves and found that they had to leave. And they jumped off the balcony and now yeah. they're dead. <laughs> no, they said that, like, 
they, they had to lean really far over the railing before they even began to feel like they might fall. Yeah. Um, they wondered if Tamla was leaning far over the railing to throw up, but there was no vomit found at the scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah um, help. As public interest in Tamla's case grew, a change.org petition was created that collected more than 709,000 signatures demanding a new investigation. Even celebrities like T.I. and 50 Cent put pressure on the Forsyth County Sheriff, and eventually they requested that the case be reopened and investigated by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. On June 12, 2020, the Forsyth County Sheriff, Ron Freeman, sent a letter to the GBI asking them to reopen and investigate the case themselves. They agreed to reopen the case six days later, but on July 28, 2021, the GBI concluded the reinvestigation and announced they would not be pressing criminal charges on anyone that was at the party with Tamla that night. So, um, here's my thoughts so far. Mm -hmm. We're almost done, but I think it is very possible that she fell. Yeah leaning over the railing or something and we talk about like it like what obviously someone it seems very like, odd what if someone was like down there like she's like having to lean over to like talk to someone or what if like you create like a little scene that yeah. she's having to like watch and and you make it like a little hard to see you or yeah. i don't know i'm just like and then she's like hey where are you going and then yeah <laughs> I, I, we talk about, like, like, we talked about Kendrick Johnson, we were, like, okay, like, that seems so weird, like, you, like, you're thinking, like, scientifically, like, physically, right. that's not possible, I, like, truly don't know, like, yeah. I don't know the possibility how of you would landing land that way, right, sure. but I do think that these people did something they shouldn't have, yeah, I don't know, I'm not saying they killed her, but they certainly did something wrong, and I, in my opinion, and I think that's why they're being shady. Right. And then I also think that very little was done for Tamla in the aftermath of her death, and so now there's nothing more right. that can be given to this unless someone confesses to something. Um, the other people in this case, people who worked on this case, have been pretty insensitive um about you know someone whose life was lost corporal mike christian um leaked sensitive information and crime scene photos hmm. and showed photos of tamla's body to two women he was trying to date to impress oh. them mm. okay in December of 2020, Jean Myers posted a photo of herself and some friends wearing Dunkin' Donuts masks, like 2020 masks, with okay. the caption, the best masks ever, hashtag if you know, you know. Mm. Mm hmm So, I want to conclude by reading the entirety of the letter Ralph Fernandez wrote to Lee Horsford because I feel like it's important and it like explains why the family is so skeptical and like he brings up like a lot of things that like make you like ask questions but they're not like reported because they're not either like public information or like not provable mm -hmm. but this is what he says okay dear Leander Two weeks ago, we finished the exhaustive review of the records related to the investigation into the death of Tamla. I am glad we had an opportunity to conference today with the rest of the immediate family. Hopefully by Tuesday, I will have a more detailed analysis, but for today, however, I want to repeat some of what I told you. The review reflects that a homicide is a strong possibility. Witness statements are in conflict. A potential subject handled the body as well as the evidence prior to the law enforcement arrival. Evidence was disposed of and no inquiry followed. The scene was not preserved. Evidence was inappropriately handled. The investigation was compromised by unauthorized access and disclosure to potential targets and witnesses. A remarkable fact is that there, are, there were no photographs taken during the autopsy of Tamla's body. This had to have been done at someone's directive because such practice is unheard of. Mm -hmm. Let us address one issue as a sample in reverse order from the above. It appears Tamla was involved in a struggle. Mm 
There were abrasions noted consistent with that scenario. There were parallel scratches to one arm. Since they were fresh, photos would have proven recent use of defensive force, but having no photos in years to our detriment. There was one x-ray, yet the injury noted as the cause of death appears nowhere. Getting the records had been another mon monumental task, to say the least. I could go on and will in a few days. Forsyth County Sheriff's Office employees have been the subject of much criticism. The case agent was a close friend of a subject who turned out to be the leak of the ongoing investigation. The town of Cumming has a history which raises eyebrows. After conducting my extensive review, I have come to the conclusion that the truth never had a chance here. Let me conclude by telling you that my years of experience lead me to believe that 80% of cases where African Americans die under mysterious circumstances end up closed or cold because there are no videos and the only witnesses are bad guys or good guys that deep down are really bad. Then you have cases where law enforcement does a poor job and cares little to investigate thoroughly because of some connection or association to the perpetrators. Take the Ahmad Arbery slaying recently. Without the video surfacing in the media, the, there would have never been an arrest in that cozy relationship between the perpetrators, prosecutors, and investigators. A rookie lawyer that gets a video in a wrongful death case where a stopped car is rear-ended by a speeding semi will win each time. A video of someone walking up to a bank teller, face uncovered, and firing a gun point blank will most certainly lead to conviction. But those facts are not what we are dealing with. Here. Here we are fighting an uphill battle because those who wear the badges and were entrusted with the investigation investigatory task failed you. But this is not over. It will never be over. Be safe. Be strong. We will get to the bottom of this. Great job. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that, yeah. like, this is, like, the issue with, like, Kendrick Johnson type cases and, and a case like this one is that everyone wants to act like it's like ridiculous to think right. that like things are being covered up to yeah think that, they were like, like tinfoil hat yeah that to think that the autopsy was like requested not to take pictures but it's also like this is happening all the time where you are at the very least fumbling the bag mm -hmm. only on cases that involve black people right and then like what are we supposed to do just go like right. oh man like it just happened. It's just a coincidence yeah. that they only mess up the cases when it's black right. people. And so, like, what are, like, we're not supposed to say, like, huh, like, yeah, you've never not taken photos in an autopsy. Like, that is, like, right. it's not that's, just, like, a, like he's saying, like, like, that's like, not a practice. thing. Yeah. An autopsy is, in large part, photos. Right. So like, it is a required it is, part of it. Right. Like, if you have done an autopsy ever in your life, like, you would know that so it just like and it does seem strange it's like a lengthy part of it so like right. it seems odd that you would get done and be like huh that was Forgot the that. autopsy and like not realize that you took no photos as right. you're like noting all of these abrasions and like breaks and things right i also I think know. with like what actually happened it is hard because truthfully again let me tinfoil hat for a second every single one of those people even the ones that say like she was good she didn't seem drunk they could be lying right like, they could have all given her copious amounts of Xanax, alcohol, you know? and, and, and she could have been off her rocker and then right. they could feel really bad that they did that they could feel yeah. responsible they could all agree to lie after she died because they don't want to be held responsible. They could have played some bad trick in game where she ended up dead. So they're all right. lying together. Like, and I think to your point that like, maybe they didn't like lure her there to yeah. make a second get out movie, right. but it does seem like they did something they're the very least like not proud of. Right. Or that they think they could get in trouble for even if like they don't think they could be like arrested like that this could end in like a wrongful death suit or like they could lose their jobs or like something that they're right. just like i can't like i can't admit to that mm -hmm. um but if you happen to have any information about the death of tamla horsford you can call in a tip 
to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-587-TIPS. Um, and they will, I mean, the case is closed, but like if you have a reason for them to reopen it. They didn't they end up reopening it then? They did reopen it and then they hmm. closed it Again. less than a year later. Okay. So that's it. Tragedy. I know. And very Liam Payne is. I know. It's like it's like I was weird. Like, I was like, I, like when it came out, I was like, no, like I just wrote this. Like, <laughs> yeah, we... that's crazy. Um, but yeah, I I have like I I did learn about Tamla Horsford in summer of 2020. Um, and I've always like kind of like grouped her with like Kendrick Johnson and there's another one I want to cover with like where a black woman is found dead in a freezer and they're like mm. oh that's normal that she's it's normal and fine um and I've always kind of like lumped them together but I do think like that I believe that the people around Tamla Horsford were maybe more culpable than some of mm. the people around Kendrick Johnson and I think like as I was writing it I was kind of like oh like maybe she did fall but then like the the more I like got into it and looked into like their behavior and like these things especially the things that the lawyer said that he was aware of like I was like mm -hmm. they like definitely like did something wrong right I just don't know what it is yeah they sus yeah and then and then posting the Dunkin Donuts mask like, yeah girl you're, that's ugly you're ugly yeah that's not cute no but Ugh. thanks for listening of course thanks for telling mm -hmm. bye, bye.